Welcome to Bottom Up, a monthly podcast dedicated to issues and topics of interest to young lawyers in Wisconsin and beyond. I'm Emil Oviagele. And I'm Kristen Hardy. And we're your hosts. This is the Bottom Up Podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bottom Up Podcast. Uh, And today we have Joe Ford, the man behind the show, who's going to be co-hosting because uh, Kristen made up some last minute excuse to not be here. She did. Yeah. She did. So definitely not getting any Christmas gifts for her. No, not this, this year. Not this year. Not this year. But, like, by the way, this is um, this is episode 17. Oh, my God. Are you serious? Yeah. 17. Jeez. You start getting paid for this. <laughs> 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 well, hey, that's amazing, though. Um, it's, you know, Joe, I think, I think that's really cool that you hear it, too, because I think back to when this podcast started, which, again, I think... It's just amazing to to have you conceptualize this thing, bring it to fruition, and I'm so honored to have you know to, to be a part of this. And I think I speak for Christine too. And most importantly, it's it's been fun. You know, is it's sometimes hectic to you know, drive around and, and come down here or go up to Madison and and all of that and take times out of our business schedules. Absolutely, but I've grown to actually look forward to it and just hearing you know the impact it's been having. Um, on members of the bar and listeners, it just has been very encouraging. So thank you, man. Like, you're, you're the man. Appreciate that, Emil. Um, thank you so much for uh, co-hosting with Kristen. It's been, it has been really fun to uh, hear all the stories, and some from young lawyers, some from mid-career lawyers, some from, you know, more experienced lawyers. But I think it's been really helpful to hear those stories. It's a different medium. It's more conversational, and you the ability of you guys to really dig into some of those major issues has been really cool to listen to, and I think we're gonna we're gonna hear another cool story today. Absolutely, absolutely. Today's episode is really cool. I mean, I think I say it out all the time, <laughs> and I'm really excited for this guest in particular. But I'm really excited about this one, and uh, for reasons that would soon become obvious. But today we're going to be dealing with uh, you know a topic that I think is top of mind for a lot of young lawyers, even if, even experienced lawyers, right? Uh, imposter syndrome and, and carving out paths in the early years of, of one's career. You know, we're taping this in, in, in March. So come May, it's graduation season and swearing in season. So in about two months, there will be a lot of young lawyers being admitted to the bar. And so I think it's a very timely topic. But not only is the topic interesting, we have a very interesting and fascinating guest None other than my my friend, my law firm partner, an all around awesome superstar, Samantha Huddleston Baker. I feel like I shouldn't introduce her because I'll be biased. All right, right all right. I'll, I'll take the lead on that. Uh, we are honored to have Sam Huddleston Baker today. She's partner at uh, OVB Law and Consulting, as Emil mentioned. Her career in the legal field, particularly in business and real estate law, has been extraordinary. Since being licensed in 2018, she has rapidly ascended to the top of her field, becoming a partner in just four years. Her journey is a beacon for young lawyers navigating the initial, often turbulent years of practice. Sam, welcome to the program today. Thank you, Joe. I'm excited to be here. I just wanted to mention also that Sam has had a, a, has really distinguished herself not only through her work on complex real estate and business acquisition matters, but also through her dedication to pro bono work and her involvement in high-stakes civil rights cases. Beyond her professional achievements, Sam is a co- committed volunteer at the Marquette University Legal Clinic and a leading figure in the State Bar of Wisconsin's Young Lawyers Division. Today, we will uncover the steps Sam took to carve out her path in the competitive world of law, her strategies for overcoming challenges and imposter syndrome, and her advice for young professionals looking to make their mark. One of the things you, you feel to mention is that I personally think, and I, if Kristen are here today, she'll agree with me, that uh, the State Bar owes Sam some money uh, <laughs> because uh, <laughs> she has been... <laughs> She's been the chair of the Young Lawyers Conference uh, Committee for the YLD for the last three years. And I know it was something Kristen did, too, for three years. And it's one of those things where you do it and you just start doing it. And for those who don't know, the Young Lawyers Conference, which just happened in Madison uh, last week, uh, which that would have been March, March 11th, right? March 8th. March 8th. It is the marquee um, conference and event that the Young Lawyer Division puts on and it takes a lot of work. So during my time on the YLD board, I avoided it like the plague. 
Um, and you were uh, one of the lucky ones. <laughs> <laughs> Sam's more committed than you are. Uh, it, it's just, it was, uh, I just wanted to show up to the party. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome, Sam. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. And um, yes, the Young Lawyers Conference is a lot of work, but it is so important to allow young lawyers an opportunity to network with those like them, those experiencing the same things that they are. And you get some free CLE credits, which is always a always a bonus. And it's exciting, and it was a thrill to plan it this year and years past, but hopefully I'm done. Um, Maybe I can pass the torch to the next person who will do even uh, greater things than I did. I mean, it was a a very well-done event. Lots of, you know, great CLEs, variety of speakers. I thought the keynote speaker was fantastic and impactful. We got to hear from um, Justice uh, Geraldine Hines, the first black female Supreme Court Justice uh, of Massachusetts, I mean, she had a very inspiring story, so I, I, I thought it was very well attended to, so very well done. Thanks, Emil. I appreciate that. Yeah, so before we get into some questions here, I, I just wanted to get a little background from you, Sam. So did, did you grow up in Wisconsin? Did, tell us a little bit about your background and then you know, where you went to law school and then what led you to, to this firm with Emil? Yeah, a good question. So I don't like to talk about myself. So let's get that out there. Um, this is, you know, a very um, intimidating experience for me. But I say that because I think it's very relevant to the topics we're going to discuss today, which is imposter syndrome, and how to overcome it or just deal with it. And this is one of those ways, you know, being able to talk about yourself, your your history, your background, your experiences, your successes, your failures, um, and be confident in it and really embody it and make it a part of who you are. Um, I am a Wisconsin girl through and through. I grew up in Greenfield, Wisconsin, which is uh, 20 minutes southwest of Milwaukee. Um, I moved to Elkhorn, Wisconsin when I was 14, which was, let me tell you, an interesting experience going from a city suburb to having a a farm across the street from your house. Lived there until I went to college at UW-Madison I got a double major in history and legal studies, which is a little bit of an odd major. Um, I like to tell people I I kind of minored in Spanish, but it was an uh, an offered minor for a Bachelor of Arts degree at Madison. But I did take six semesters, studied abroad in Madrid. A great experience, I think, definitely opened up my, my worldview, took me out of my element a little bit. When I came back, got ready to take the LSAT and apply for law schools, ultimately decided to go to Marquette University Law School, and I'm still very grateful for that for that decision. Not only did I meet some great people, learn from some wonderful professors, and just, I think, thrived in the smaller community that Marquette creates, and I also met my husband there. So uh, that's always an added added plus. That's great. Did, so... When you were in college, did you ha- did you know you you were going to go to law school? What was the impetus for for law school? Yeah, I'm unfortunately one of those. I've always known I wanted to go okay. to law school. People, I think it's just been something that my family's kind of you know I'm a first generation lawyer, pretty much a first generation college student. My mom got her bachelor's degree after I got mine. But it was always something my, my family kind of pushed me towards. So like, you're so smart. You love to read. You, you argue a lot. Um, you, you don't take no for an answer. Um, so it's something that, that I've always kind of had in the back of my mind. And I think as I progressed through school and, you know, just other social interactions, I, I never found anything else that I was passionate about. Mm-hmm. I never found anything else that really intrigued me, that made me want to say, well, maybe the law isn't for me. Maybe going to law school isn't my path. So I stuck with it. And you said something earlier on that I think is important uh, to follow up on because it's something you know a lot of lawyers say, or a lot of younger professionals, not wanting to talk about themselves and 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 being being a little coy in sharing their stories. Believe it or not, I once upon a time suffered from that. No, same anxiety. I don't believe it. I'm serious. <laughs> <laughs> oh, same anxiety. But I've come to realize that. Our stories matter, and it, it, it matters because it's our way of putting out our souls and our contributions into the world, and you never know who might just be listening. And it's not necessarily for impact value, but sometimes you listen to people's stories and you get a sense of appreciation for what the world is, appreciation for their journeys, appreciation for yours. 
Um, and sometimes you get a, okay, a me too moment. And I think that that is something that people um, ought to ought to realize is very important. So uh, for anyone out there shy of sharing the stories. Yeah, and you're, you're so right. If I can just kind of go back to when I was at UW-Madison, I tutored for the mathematics program at one of the high schools in Madison. And I had that experience, and that kind of led me to keep sharing my story and my journey with other people, no matter how inconsequential I think it is. I tutored this student. She was a young girl thinking about you know, going to college and not even sure if she should go to college because her, her parents weren't supportive. She didn't necessarily think she was smart enough to do it. She's like, well, here I am getting tutored. You know, what am I going to do in college? You know, I'm not smart enough to go there. And then she asked me what I was going to do. And I told her I was applying to law schools and I wanted to be a lawyer. And she thought that was the coolest thing ever. And she said, I always thought, you know, it would be so cool to be a lawyer, but I could never do that. And for a 14, 15 year old girl to look at you and say that was just so devastating to me because everybody should at least have the ability to believe in themselves that they can try and at least have the opportunity to do it. So I told her, I said, you just have to work really hard. You can't give up. You have to keep your head in the game. You have to stay focused, do your schoolwork, be kind to others, and you know, you'll know you get to where you want to go. You'll, you'll realize your passions and your dreams. But yeah, that just you know, um, struck a chord with me because it is important to speak about those things and speak about your path. So people understand, you know, you weren't the most confident person ever uh, when you started your journey. And now a word from our sponsors. Created by Wisconsin lawyers in 1986 to protect the financial future of lawyers like themselves and the clients they serve, Wilmick continues to demonstrate a leading commitment to Wisconsin's legal community. No company is more trustworthy than Wilmick when you're facing a legal malpractice claim. Put your trust in your premium with an insurance company that supports Wisconsin legal associations and events. Wilmick, insuring and supporting the legal community since 1986. Thank you. And now back to the Bottom Up Podcast. Which also reminds me, uh, on the topic of telling stories, I, I still remember one of the most impactful pieces I've ever read in the Wisconsin Lawyer Magazine, and Joy, was your piece. And that has inspired me in so many ways because when we get to tell our stories, number one, it's the only time, especially in our busy lives, where we get to even reflect on the journeys we've been through, right? It's, it's, it's a catharsis to it. And two, the way we tell our stories, and, and yours was a, ma- was, was, a, was a master class in telling the story, but also expressing vulnerability in a profession. We did a whole episode on this in a profession where, you know, we're, we're taught to be Teflon Don. And that, 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 those are the common threads, I think, that binds us as human beings, especially, like I said, I think, I think the profession really needs human beings, imperfect human beings as well. Um, but I don't want to throw us off of a track, though. Joe had asked the question about, you know, how you knew you were going to, you know, you wanted to go to law school. I have a slightly different but related question. At what point did you realize that law was your calling? This is going to sound cheesy, and it's not because you're in this room and doing this podcast, but I do think it was when I joined the firm as a, what do we call it, receptionist, legal (laughs) intern, law clerk, secretary, runner. I did all of it. But I think that that really solidified it for me because any lawyer will tell you law school is the worst in terms of the internal struggle that you have with yourself, the turmoil that you have to go through, the imposter syndrome you even have sometimes in law school. If it's, you know, um, something new to you, if you don't have other lawyers in your family to guide you through the process, if you're in a different city, what have you. So when you're in law school, you're, you're trying to do your best, be academic, but also gain experience at the same time and sift through all of these areas of law and figure out where you fit. What's, what is your place? What's, what's my place in this profession? And when I joined the firm, I kind of felt that. I felt, okay, my passion for the law is working with clients. My passion for the law is counseling people and giving them a sense of you're not alone. Somebody else is here. We're going to guide you through it. We'll let you know what the good, the bad, the ugly is, and you're going to come out okay at the end. And I know, you know, the firm was built kind of on that premise of being able to advocate and practice in that way. Mm -hmm. And that really made me feel 
comfortable and and passionate. I don't, I don't want to say comfortable in the sense that, you know, um, that was going to be the end for me, right? Mm-hmm. But comfortable in the sense that I felt I can do this. Mm-hmm. And I, I like doing it. And the long hours and emotions that come with practicing law is worth it if that's the return. Well, I mean, it's crazy to me that that's, that's, that that's the moment because what you don't realize is that in that same moment, I thought you were crazy. <laughs> I, you, know, in, in, you know, and I don't think a lot of people know the this, know this story about us, but at the time you had joined the firm, first things first. I, this, in what year was this? This was in 2016, I believe. It was December of 2016. It, and was this right after you graduated? or No, this was uh, the end of my first semester of my second, yeah, my second year oh, of law okay, school. okay, okay. So um, <laughs> I had just, I graduated in 2014, so it wasn't like I had this wealth of experience to share. I had been practicing law for two, two, about two and a half years at the time, left a, a quite secure job at, at, um, at a national firm to start the law firm. And so the law firm started, was, was founded June of 2016. So the law firm had been in existence for about six months. I was in a shared office space at Regis at the time. It was so bootstrapped that I wasn't even available for Sam's interview. My wife, Natalie, um, would have to step. She, she, she's in HR. I was traveling with the Marquette Law School mock trial team. And um, I'm like, oh, shoot, I have this interview, right? And I remember, I think one of the reasons I didn't even stay was because I remember looking at your resume, and I'm like, there's no way she's going to want, like, you know, with this weird-ass dude with a weird last name, two and a half years out of law school, right? Like, because at the time, I believe you were, like, top 25% of your class. You are going to Marquette. I'm just like, she's not going to. So I'm like, you know what, I'm going to Chicago with the law school team, with the mock trial team. And I called into the interview, and and, and that's sort of how that, that, that's how that's it, started. it started. I was looking for a law clerk, and yeah, and so we we left. So in, in truth, you were the first law clerk, the first employee of the firm, the first legal assistant, the first paralegal runner. I mean, you did everything, which was crazy. So she was in charge. Because <laughs> the whole and the whole time, the whole time. Even up, even 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 you know up until recently, I, I, the whole time I'm like, this is crazy. Like, what is wrong with her? You know, doesn't she know? And and I say all that to say, those and I don't think I've ever said this to you before. Those early moments when you said yes to the paltry was it what, thirteen, twelve bucks an hour, sixteen, six or oh, sixteen then? Oh 16. man, I, oh geez, we were progressive even back yeah. then. When you said yes. You don't understand. So the firm was at its infancy. There were lots of doubts. There was there were lots of, hey, can I really do this? What the hell am I doing? My mother thought I was crazy, rightfully so. That, yes, kept me going. The sense that I, I and, and through the very early, you know, even till this day, the fact that I had someone who believed in me who didn't have to. Because when your parents believes in you, when your spouse believes in you, when your friends believe in you, there's there's a reason for them to give you friends, right? You you know they, they know you, but to have a stranger who didn't have to has been one of the most impactful things. And so that's when I knew that okay, this was the path. So it's crazy. And let's be clear, I was just looking for a job at the time. <laughs> I didn't know anything about you. Um, I, I knew a little bit about the firm, but it was really working with you, working for our clients, seeing the process, and just the growth that we had over the first couple of years that made me want to stay. Yeah. And the only reason you got the job was because of the answer you gave to this question. I will never forget it. So I'm, I'm, I'm on the phone finally at the end. I'm I'm like, like, why do you want to work here? Like this makes no sense. And Samantha did something so bold that I resonated with. If anyone who knows me, I have a no BS personality. And she says, Oh, yeah, like, you know, I mean, OCIs were done. Uh, I need to make some money for the next four to five months. And so I see you're hiring. And so, yeah, that's, that's kind of why I'm, you know, I'm applying here. Normally, most law school students will give you some, you know, endearing answer of, hey, you know, I want to work at a small firm and all that stuff. And I was like, okay, 
I respect that. I can rock with that. I know you will always be honest. And it was realistic. And so, <laughs> I don't know if you remember that. Those OCIs that are no joke. <laughs> Let me tell you. It's like getting your heart broken time and time again. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's. I mean, that's who I am, though. I, I'm not going to sugarcoat it if it, it doesn't need to be sugarcoated. Either you like me or you don't. But, you know, it was an opportunity I found out of the blue. I went for it, and here we are. And now, word from our sponsors. Hi, Russell Nicolay here with Nicolay Law, Accident and Injury Lawyers. If you have clients that have been injured, my office would love the opportunity to help them get compensated and get their life back on track. We handle referrals and co-counsel relationships on injury cases all across Wisconsin. Thank you. And now back to the Bottom Up Podcast. Well, let's talk about those early career and years. You know, looking back at, at the first few years of becoming licensed, it was 2018. What steps did you take to figure out your path in, in business and real estate law? I wish... There was a profound answer for that. The real answer is experience and what comes through the door. As a small firm, I mean, you can imagine those who work for small firms know, even at large firms, I would say, what comes through the door is what you're going to work on. And you don't always get to pick what the issues are, what the matters are that you're handling. But I think what really drove my passion and made me maybe seek out more opportunities in, in business and real estate were the, the, the first couple of clients we had at the firm in that they are just so such interesting people. Emil always says they're serial entrepreneurs, which is so true. They just have their you know hands in a lot of different pots, working on some amazing things, and they gave us the opportunity, right? They gave me the opportunity to show them that I'm competent in, in, what, they're, in what, what legal services they need and I'm also diligent in in being a, in advocating for them, right? In being there, in answering their questions, their text messages, their phone calls, meeting when th- with them when they need to. And as I worked with these clients, I just got to see all of the different areas that they have invested in, and that gave me again the opportunity to learn more about those areas of law. And when I did that, I found that the legal or the, how do I want to say this? The legal part of running a small business is very fascinating. And it's something that a lot of small business owners don't have time for. And they just don't have the education for because they didn't go to school to be a lawyer. They started their business to do what they're passionate about. And so um, I found that it's it's invigorating and and fulfilling to work with them in, in pursuing and, and propelling their passions forward. And real estate, real estate's just cool. Um, and I just, I just took a, a, a liking to it right away because it's so fascinating. It has so many different factors. And I think it's, um, it's a good area of the law if you'd like to talk to people because, I, and we, we talked about this in my panel for, on the YLC, you have to be the intermediary for a lot of different third-party professionals in order to give your client the best value. Appraisers, inspectors, what have you. And I really enjoy that. There must have been, I mean, and this kind of gets into our topic, right? As a new attorney, there must have been times when you something, a matter comes to you and you're like, I, I don't have any idea where to start. I don't even know what to do with this. Or, you know, how do I, what am I supposed to do here? Because this is never, I've never worked on something like this. Definitely. And that's why people always ask me, they're like, oh, were you a business major, econ major, did you do real estate development? No, I did history and legal studies. Right. Um, so a lot of this I had to learn on the fly. I had to dig down, sit down, read a lot, um, read a lot of case law, read a lot of uh, secondary sources, statutes, go through register of deeds documents, and talk to people. I had to you know, talk to Emil, and if Emil didn't know, talk to another attorney, I talk to my clients a lot. You know, they're great resources, especially those who are in a specific industry and they've been doing it for years. They'll give you some some guidance on who to talk to, where to look, and other, you know, government agencies. I know I did a couple of things with the Department of Revenue and IRS early on in my career. And again, I have not a tax professional. I barely knew how to file my own taxes when I graduated law school. You know how to file it now? Uh, um, I can use TurboTax. <laughs> <laughs> Did that for a couple of years. 
But, you know, being able to reach out to uh, an agent with the Department of Revenue and say, hey, can you walk me through this or can you provide me with the resources so that I can find an answer? You just have to be really dogged in your efforts and, and not give up, know when to ask for help and and just go through the process. Yeah. And just one, just one more follow up on that to put it to put that in context. So. The matters you are working on, these are like startup companies in, in some cases. So you're like starting from scratch, essentially, trying to help them put in the structure in place to be able to start the business. Is that- yeah, yeah, that was a lot of what I did early on. I still do a lot of that, um, being able to tell them what kind of entity they should form, uh, what what's important in their corporate governing documents, uh, what considerations to think about given the industry that they're in. Again, I took a lot of research, a lot of googling a lot of westlaw and lexus and and all and books unbound you know uh, all of the resources that are available to young lawyers and and lawyers just in in the state of wisconsin and being able to synthesize it and and learn it and internalize it and then regurgitate it back to the client so that they can understand it yeah um and and something that i can confirm just having observed you and, and, and being a part of your career uh, since law school, I think is applicable to, to the idea of imposter syndrome is dealing with it, right? So if you think about imposter syndrome, a lot of that is rooted in fear, which is a very rational reaction, right? Fear is a rational reaction to, you know, when we, when we are faced with things we're not familiar with, it's instinctual. So the fear then leads to doubt, um, I think. So when you put fear and doubt together without necessarily taking into account you know who you are and what you bring to the situation that leads to imposter syndrome and I think what you just said about your journey and how you dealt with that highlights what you do when you have that the best way to combat imposter syndrome which happens to be the best way to combat fear in most instances preparation right because you know you can't fight the reactions or you can't fight the and it's going to happen. Then the question becomes, what do you do with it, right? Um, and so if you are going, you know, you're, you're doing a deal you've never done before, right? You're going to prepare more and over, even over-prepare to overcompensate or compensate for that fear. And I think during that preparation period, you get to realize what you know. You, you actually may know a little bit more than you do know, uh, but it also kind of gives you a comfort level to deal with it, uh, which I think is very important in, in dealing with imposter syndrome. Fear can be paralyzing, and I think a lot of young attorneys deal with that because they don't have the confidence in their knowledge and in their performance. Being a lawyer is sometimes being a performer. You have to uh, perform for your client, right? You have to give them the advice that they need. You have to do the work that they're asking you. You have to, you know, if you're a trial lawyer, you have to go to trial, and you have to perform for the jury and the judge, and you have to be confident in how you carry that because if you don't have that confidence then the people listening to you and, and, and learning from you aren't going to be confident in what they're hearing. So exactly to your point, being being informed, being educated about what you're talking about, what you're advising on, and and really internalizing that, yes, I do know this, I'm confident in it, and I'm going to work through it to make sure that I'm presenting the best case or giving the best advice that I can. Yeah. And we've talked about this in the past in terms of preparation. I also try to harness the the advantages of imposter syndrome. I think people should keep that as part of their identity because what does imposter syndrome lead you to do? It leads you to prepare. It leads you and it keeps you intellectually humble. So Sam and I, you know, when, when we have, when we deal with cases and things, I, I, I tell her like I, I like to research like it's my first year on the job. Because I also tell people this, the most dangerous attorney to go up against in my, my world and litigation isn't necessarily the guy with about 60, 70 years of experience. It's a guy with 60 years of experience who still practices law like it's day one, who still puts in that amount of preparation, who still feels like, okay, hey, I could lose it at any point in time. The, you know, and, and I think sometimes people think by, you know, to overcome imposter syndrome is to just be able to perform and lose the abilities to actually go back and prepare to just have the answers whenever you're called upon, right? And I think that could actually become even more dangerous of a thing, if anything else, 
And so I think, and I encourage people to keep a little bit of it. It, it keeps you humble and it keeps you intellectually curious. It keeps you intellectually humble. How, how would we haven't, we we're talking about imposter syndrome. How would we define that? How would you define it? I think imposter syndrome means you don't feel like you're adequate for the job or you're pretending to be something that you're not. And I feel like every young attorney I talk to has at least an iota of it when they first graduate and as they start practicing. They don't feel like they're a lawyer. They feel like they're playing dress up, right? You're putting on a suit and you're going into meetings and you have no idea what you're talking about. Why is this person across the table listening to me? Why are they taking my advice? I don't really know anything. But you just finished law school. You went through three years of learning how to learn. And that sounds weird, right? But that's really what law school is. You're learning how to learn about different areas of law, how to read case law, how to read statutes, how to navigate processes. That's what your client wants from, from you, right? And so being able to get over that hump of you know, the, the confidence hump that I can't do this, who am I to give somebody else advice? Who am I to say I'm a, a lawyer? I mean, that's, that's, that's the goal, right, to get over that, that hump. Yeah. Well, Joe, let me ask you this, because I think you've talked about, I think in your piece back in the Wisconsin Lear Magazine, you talked about this a little bit, the sense of imposter syndrome and feeling it. Um, and you had to go through it at some point in your, in your career. Um, how, what was that feeling like, and how did you deal with it? Yeah, I, I think that at all points in life, you're going to feel that at some point when you have a new challenge. And, you know, when I started out in my career, I guess it started in law school. There were other times, you know, in my childhood and whatever and other periods. But in law school, it becomes real Mm -hmm. because you're you're going up against um, you're trying to compete against really smart people. And you you think to yourself, do I belong here? And I think you have to really work through that with what you said, preparation. So. I'm in the I'm in the library till midnight every night. I'm I'm making sure that I'm working harder than everyone else, or at least trying to, because in moments of self self doubt, I think the only thing you can do is just work harder, to make sure that you feel a sense of confidence in what you're doing, and I think that in any challenge that you have, you're gonna feel can I can I do this or not, and you if you're paralyzed with fear you're not going to do anything. The only thing you can do is sort of work through it and, and work as hard as you can so that you develop that sense of confidence. And now a word from our sponsors. What? You don't have an ultimate pass yet. Oh, that's a mistake. Find out why at wispar.org slash ultimate pass. Thank you. And now back to the bottom up podcast. One of the things I, I wanted to ask you um, both is the dynamic between the, the sort of partner level and the associate, because you come into a firm and you know you're you feel like you don't know anything. You're learning. You're trying. You're trying to prepare. You're doing all these things. And do you think there? Are, I guess for for Emil, as now having more experience, are there? Do you think there are times where associates? don't want to approach a partner because they're they feel like they would be bothering bothering them because i I've, I've encountered situations where it could take me five hours to research something and understand a concept where if i would have just asked a more experienced attorney it would could have take five minutes to understand it but there is a fear that i don't want to bother the partner i i, I you know they hired me to work through this and to figure it out on my own. At what point do you think it's okay to say, well, you know, I do not, I shouldn't spend any more time on this. I'm just going to go ask the experienced attorney on this. I mean, what, so I think, I bet you there's a lot of associates out there who feel that it's like, well, I'm just going to keep working until I figure this out on my own. But if they just ask the question, it could be answered within five seconds. Um, do you, do you ever, talk about that with other younger attorneys or experience that? Uh, yeah, it's, 
So obviously, the busier, the, the, the more experienced one gets in their practice and the busier they get in their practice, right? You sometimes may forget to give grace. Uh, something that I always have to be mindful of when I'm approached by younger attorneys, just because, you know, to you, what they're asking might seem so simple and so easy and like inconsequential, but to them, it's their whole world, right? And what I try to tell younger associates is do one or two, do two things. First, just do some initial work so you know what you're talking about. I don't believe in the adage of there are no stupid questions. There are absolutely very stupid <laughs> questions. So I, so, and, and, and for me, the way I define a stupid question is not necessarily the way the question's framed. Is if the question has been asked in a way where there has been no perspective or reflective thought given into it or, per, or preparation at all, especially if you are, if those resources are available to you, right? So um, let me give you an example. Before you go ask, in the context of a conversation between a partner and an associate in litigation, and the partner says, hey, you know, re, you know uh, this looks like an economic loss doctrine issue, okay? Now, it wouldn't be a stupid question for the associate in that moment to say, hey, what is the economic loss doctrine, right? It might be a very stupid question if the partner has says, hey, I need you to go take a look at this issue of the economic loss doctrine, or um, you come across that economic loss doctrine while reviewing a brief, and you haven't, and an associate doesn't even do enough work or a quick Google search to figure out what that term means, and then comes and says, "Okay, hey, you know," I and mean, that's just a, that's just an example. But but either way, so first things first, just do some basic legwork. And number two, you have to be dogged and persistent because you know partners are busy, and sometimes they may be short. And that's okay. It's not personal because I think younger associates and all of us, we get in our heads a lot of times. So I think understanding the person you're asking and being able to study them, it's just just also emotional intelligence. And you can't be shy because I tell people this, if you refrain from knowing more or gaining knowledge from a partner or a supervisor or a colleague because, you know, you just don't want to bother them, that's your loss. Because the law, the legal field is very personal. It's a very personal career. You know, you get the JD, you get the license, it's attached to you. So it is on you to go out there and figure it out and also be that persistent in asking those questions. I think Sam may also have a, you know, a similar, likely different perspective as well. I think it comes down to sometimes human instinct where we want to sometimes be people pleasers. We don't want to come off as... Um, not knowledgeable about things. Uh, we don't want to come off as naive. And so we can be scared to go to somebody and ask for help. But just like Emil said, it's all about how you ask for help and how you engage in those conversations. More oftentimes than not, a partner will stop what they're doing and say, hey, yeah, that's a great question. I'll get back to you on it. Or let schedule some time with me and we can talk about it on Thursday at three o'clock, right? Or maybe they'll just say, oh, I don't know the answer, but we have an internal memo all about that topic, right? And they can give you a resource. But coming to them and, and being able to say, hey, I, I have this issue or, or there's this legal concept I'm not aware of. I looked into it and this is my understanding or this is what I'm going to do on the case. I'd like your feedback. Can we go through it? That shows the the partner that you are being a critical thinker, that you're doing your work, that you understand when it's time to ask for help, um, which is important, right? We don't want people to go out there and commit malpractice and do things because they they were too scared to ask. But you should still have an understanding and still have done that initial work to be able to get to that conversation. You have to be able to have an intelligent conversation about the questions you're asking. Absolutely, and I want to complete what I said, because I think there's another a- angle to it, right? So what the partners and other experienced attorneys, what, what should they do when they get a question or are uh, presented with, by, uh, with an issue by an associate that they believe um, is you know, stupid or whatever? Obviously, you shouldn't tell the, you know, the younger attorney that that's a stupid question or that they're stupid because obviously, again, you have to show grace. But this is how you can use that as an opportunity to stimulate curiosity, Right. So if I get a question in the context that I said where I believe, okay, hey, some research hasn't been done, I say, okay, you know, I, how, 
what do you think it is? Like, could you go, go take a look at this? How about you go take a look at this and this and this and let's come back and let's have a conversation? Because I do know that if, especially if it's a complex issue that may have certain nuances to it, if I answer, I give you a simple answer, you're never truly going to understand the depths. And because we have a duty to ensure that we are training younger lawyers and mentoring them, we also have to challenge them. And then I remind the associate or the younger attorney of who they are. I remind them of what they learned. I tell them there's a reason it's called practice in law. I remind them there's a reason they never learned of any specific substantive issues in law. They were taught how to think through issues because the law comes with the fundamental understanding that it changes. And the tools that they have to go figure out new issues, that's at the very core of the practice of law. And the reason you do that is you, it's, it's a way to get them past imposter syndrome because the thing about imposter syndrome is the first question you have to ask yourself is, is it a rational fear? And, and what, what do you do about it? So I get them to remember, okay, hey, you're scared about this, but it's not rational in a sense because you have the tools for it. So remind them of who they are because if you're reminded of who you are, you don't get to ask or you, you, the instances where you get to doubt your place within the law or in a specific issue um, um, or, or reduced or the, the likelihood of that happening you know, or, or negate, is negated. So um, it's a double-edged sword, right? So I think associates and partners and mentors and older attorneys and younger attorneys, they have a role to play um, in that dynamic. And now, word from our sponsors. State Bar of Wisconsin members have access to affordable insurance plans, including term life, accident, critical illness, and accidental death and dismemberment. Coverage is issued by the Prudential Insurance Company of America. Four plans for your financial future from one trusted source. For more information, visit wisbar.memberenroll.com. Thank you. And now back to the Bottom Up Podcast. Absolutely. Follow up on that. The associate comes to you. You say, all right, why don't you look at you're still learning, you're still getting trained in this area of law or these concepts or principles or whatever. You say, go, go look at these three things. And it's going to take you five hours to do that. There, there, I've also encountered situations where I've been asked to do that. And I go back and it takes me five hours to do that. But I'm working on a project too that has billable hours associated with it. And I think to myself, this is taking me too long. And I just work. I just worked for five hours to figure this out. But I don't think I should probably bill that much because it took me too long. Mm-hmm. That's something I always thought about too. That I didn't really get clarification about. What sort of? I guess that's a different, different no, issue. I, but. I, I get what you're saying, and <clears throat> the answer to that is is complex. It's not clear. But the best thing you can do is go and ask your partner or anybody else who has some authority to talk about billable hour requirements, ask them, should I bill this? Shouldn't I bill it? They're not going to be mad at you because it's taking you time to learn about something brand new. That's the learning curve that comes with being an associate, Mm -hmm. being a new attorney. You're going to have that learning curve. I still have that learning curve sometimes on, on specific matters and I'm in my sixth year of practice, but being able to have that conversation and, and being open in that communication to say, Hey, this is taking me a while. I'm okay with that. I'll put the work in. I, I can do the late nights to learn about this issue, but do I bill it to the client or not? Usually they'll say yes because they want to see a reflection of your work. And then on the administrative side, they can discount it or credit it or whatever they want to do yeah. for that client relationship. Okay. And, and to young associates, if you are just starting off and you are at a firm that wouldn't let you explore new issues or spend time and an inordinate amount of time learning about new issues, you should leave that firm because you will never be great. You will never know what you need to do. And if, and for on the flip side of things, for, for experienced attorneys and, more, and, and, and for law firms, if you are not willing to allow those excesses, then why, why, why then don't hire younger lawyers. But we all know, but you have to, right? Because that's how everyone learns. So I, I, I tell, I, you know, I tell the associates of the firm, like, go learn those issues. Like, it's fine. Like, spend the time, spend, you know, put in the work. And that's why I, I, you know, when we talk about the work-life balance conversation, 
I'm, I'm very hesitant because I know there's a time for everything. It is absolutely appropriate to spend an inordinate amount of time trying to master your craft at the early phases of it. There is nothing wrong with that. There's a reason for that because, right, it's a give and take because that way you're, you're spending additional time mastering your craft. Obviously, the, the firm has a business to run, and you're also trying to bill, right? The question then becomes, okay, well, this, that shouldn't be the modus operandi for the, for the entirety of your career. Uh, and so I... I don't. I think firms shouldn't put those pressures on younger associates. Um, obviously, there are these are complex issues, but I think younger attorneys must be given the opportunities to learn, the time to learn, and the opportunities to make mistake and be corrected with grace. And younger associates or younger attorneys need to be intellectually curious and dedicated to learning. Because if you are not, if you are not built to learn and labor hours and hours on on the smallest substantive issues, well, this is not the career for you. Right. So, Sam, we we talked a little bit about your navigation through sort of the early years. What are some of the immediate challenges you faced as a new attorney, though? When you look back at that period, what are some of the, the biggest challenges that you feel like you encountered? I think there's two that come to mind right away. The first being interacting with other more senior attorneys. I may be a little bit unique in the sense that I had carte blanche to just go out and practice the law, right? Emil was a great mentor in allowing me an opportunity to fail, opportunity to prove myself as well. So on cases or, or matters where I had to, you know, communicate directly with opposing counsel or counsel on, on the other side, you know, sometimes there is a, a, an interesting dynamic when a, a more senior attorney has to speak with somebody who's just starting off. They may want to correct you. They may want to inform you that you don't know what you're doing. Maybe you need to go back and look at that, right? And there's a way to be on the opposite side and be civil and say to this new attorney, you know, give them a chance. Give them a chance to represent their client, to prove their case. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to probably do things wrong. They're going to take additional time to get you responses or whatever it may be. But you don't have to be a bully, right? And and I dealt with a lot of that as a yeah. as a, a young attorney and, and probably a female attorney as well. And you just have to kind of, you know, grind your teeth and get through it. Um, it's, it's not going to be great. You're not going to come out on... Uh, feeling the best about uh, yourself or this other attorney. But I think if you have that fire inside of you and you say, oh, I'll prove this person wrong, right? I'll prove this guy or girl wrong. I'm going to do what I can to be the best for myself. I don't know if you remember this, just speaking on that particular issue. I think recently uh, we had a younger associate who was on the other side of uh, who brought a plaintiff's uh, plaintiff's employment law case uh, against a state agency filed it in federal court, and the opposing counsel, you know, much more experienced uh, than myself and, and also the associate, uh, rather than um, sending us an email to tell us, like, hey, FYI, there's this thing about the claims that you just brought that makes them not maintainable against a state agency, you know, you, or go back, you don't know what you're doing. You know, she did something that I, 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 that I was so inspired by, and I think we can all learn from. She sent us an email and said, hey, I just want to bring to your attention that, you know, based off of this case and the statute, you can't maintain these claims against a state agency. You know, I'm not going to file a motion to dismiss. You can you you can amend it because this is the this is the actual statute. And it was such a showing of grace in a teachable moment because a needless motion to dismiss would have been could have been filed, which even if granted, would have been offered another opportunity to amend and likely would have, you know, found the, the, the right statute. But just showing that grace and that level of, 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 of tutelage and while, while, you know, while also being aggressive and just saying, hey, we're not, I'm not going to waste the time with, you know, with, with grant, with posturing. But hey, I can teach you something. And, and, and then, you know, I hopped on the phone with her and she said, hey, that, it's fine. It's, you know, it, it happens every now and then. I've just been doing this area for 30 years and so I just kind of have an extra ounce of knowledge and so why waste time you know if you want to amend your complaint amend your complaint and then I'll respond to that and that there was a master class in in being on the opposing side 
dealing with a younger lawyer, less experienced lawyer, correcting them and still being able to show grace while still, I mean, and I have zero doubts that we're up against a very formidable adversary um, because litigation, at least my, uh, it's an adversarial process. And I I think sometimes uh, the profession does lack that. If you're a good attorney and you're good at what you do and you have a strong case, there's no room or need for for that type of behavior or those types of conversations to, you know, belittle another attorney or make them seem like they don't know what they're talking about. I, I said there was two things. Uh, the, the other thing that comes to mind is access. And, and what I mean by that is you just graduated with, you know, your, your law school class. Those are the people you know. You don't really know other attorneys. You don't really know other professionals. You know your professors and you know your classmates. And depending on what size firm you're in or, or what type of an environment you're, you're practicing in, it may be hard to access other attorneys, to, to pick their brain on things, to learn from them, to talk about imposter syndrome, right? And so I, I found that to be quite challenging when I first started, especially, you know, it was just Emil and I. And He's a great mentor. He had a lot of insight, but it's just one person. And he, you know, he suggests, he's like, get involved, join the state bar, join the MBA, go to networking events, talk to people. And, you know, that was something new for me. But being able to go out there and do those things really did help. Because I think once you have a network of other attorneys and professionals, you feel more comfortable in your practice. Yeah, absolutely. And the, and the, the ability to... Um What's wrong with you? I don't Joe? know. I gotta get something. In the- <clears throat> Drink some water. Don't I did. Are you okay? Um, but meeting with other attorneys who are going through the same things and and discussing those, it really does. I think it really does help in going to conferences and um, joining those different um, bar groups. Uh, I think that it's important. No one wants to feel alone. I mean, think back to schoolwork, right? When you have to do something on your own and you're going through it, you question yourself, you question the product that you're delivering, you might question your ability to learn something. When you do it as a team, it it alleviates that stress because you have reassurance from somebody else that you're doing something right. You have other opinions or other thoughts to bounce off um, and and come up with maybe a a better solution or a better resolution. And the same goes for practicing law. Doing yeah. it on your own can be tough. Yeah. So, Emil, we're at about an hour. Okay. And I don't know if you know this, but I think we have people listening on the outside who might want to call in. You might have some callers. Might have some callers? Okay. I need to tell them to call. <laughs> uh, I thought you think this were a radio station. Um, let's see. Uh, Dust. Uh, sorry. Kate. That's Connor. Um, I was going to think, you, you talk, like, earlier on, too, didn't I also introduce you to Rebecca Lopez? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, could you, like, link that to, because I remember when, earlier on, one of the reasons I did that was I also was very aware of my limitations, um, and Rebecca Lopez, being part Hispanic, and you, you, know, you being part Hispanic, was someone who, first, she was first-generation lawyer. I felt, okay, hey, like, you guys can probably, she's a woman, she can probably relate. I think you may get to maybe talk about that and why, again, it, it matters, representation matters in sharing your story. And the only reason I know that about Rebecca is because Rebecca shares her stories. I started sharing her story afterwards. Um, I used to think she was just legendary. I, I still think so. But I don't know if you want to touch on that. Yeah, a bit. it was intimidating to <clears throat> reach out to uh, another lawyer who was at a larger firm. She's at Godfrey and Khan and ask her to have lunch with me or dinner with me, right? She's busy. She's got a family. She's doing her own thing. Like, who am I to just come out of the blue and say, hey, can you talk with me? But I did, and she was like, absolutely. I would love to speak with you. Let's grab dinner. We had dinner, and it was an amazing conversation. And it also reaffirmed, you know, my beliefs in my practice and reaffirmed what I knew because she does mostly employment law. And I was just talking to her about some things in, in employment law and handling, you know, managing clients and client expectations and all things she was saying. I was like, oh, I know that. Like, I, I'm doing that. So it gave me a sense of comfort as well to know that, you know, she's been practicing for so long. She's a very well known, very great attorney. And, you know, I'm I'm kind of doing the right things. I'm taking the right steps. So, yeah, that's just that's to say, you know, if. 
you know of somebody who you look up to, who you think might be a great mentor, who shares similar life experiences as you, reach out to them. They might not be able to drop everything they're doing and get coffee with you tomorrow, but they may say, hey, in three or four months, let's get dinner. Let's grab a drink. Let's go out for coffee. I'm going to this networking event. You should come too. We can connect there. I, that's what, I do that a lot um, when law students reach out to me. Oh, there's a networking event. Why don't you come? We can talk. And then you can meet some other people too because I might not be even the right person to, to speak with you. So that was a, a, a big moment for me to be able to talk with her and, and have her. Whoa. <laughs> Is that our caller? We got a caller. So, so just just before we, we get that call in, I think it's important we tell uh, listeners what we're doing here. So given the topic and given the fact that we have lawyers who are graduating from law school very soon, um, and given that uh, I think Joe and I are becoming two older lawyers to go back to what we wanted to know back when we just started, we decided we were going to open this up and take questions, uh, written questions, and maybe calls from current younger lawyers about, you know, about the questions they have about navigating their paths in law during the first couple of years and dealing with imposter syndrome. So we can go to the phones, and we also have some written questions. Hello. Hi there. Uh, this is Connor. I'm a first year attorney uh, here in Milwaukee. Hey, Connor. Um, and I was curious if, if you guys have um, any rules of thumb or general guidance um, in most effectively using support staff. Uh, for me, this is my first time having any anybody that I could you know, potentially use as uh, a resource or direct um, to help my work. And I was curious how you balance um, you know, ensuring that you get experience in details of cases but are still using your resources effectively and efficiently? That's a great question. Um, It's going to depend, obviously, right, on the size of your firm and and what your support staff expectations are. But I think support staff is probably one of the best learning resources for young lawyers. They're going to know probably more than you will when you first come into uh, your practice. They're going to not only know areas of law and processes that you may not be uh, aware of, but they're also going to know your firm culture and, you know, how certain partners like things or how certain attorneys like to, um, you know, manage their schedule or, or, or write briefs or file documents. And so they're going to be able to give you that insight. As far as from a work perspective, I would say don't rely too heavily on, on support staff at first because you want to be able to know how to do what they do. At some point in your career, you're, you may have a paralegal that's solely assigned to you or that solely works with you. And you have to know the, how to do the work that you're assigning to them. You can't effectively tell them to do something if you don't know how to do it yourself. So I would say be cautious in, in relying too much on them for the work that you know you have to do or that you should do. But also contact them if you're if you're overworked or overloaded. They may be able to say, "Hey, I can take that off your plate. I, you know, I can start a template for you, or I can create a shell for you." And you know, I guess it, it all goes back to communication. Being able to effectively communicate with them your needs, your questions, and and maybe what they're willing to do. We also have another question from Jenny, a new associate in Milwaukee, and she 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 says or she asks, "Sometimes I experience imposter syndrome when I realize another attorney or judge is mistaken about the law." But I'm hesitant to speak up due to their experience. Do you have any advice for navigating the situation? If you're confident and you've done the research, speak up. Don't be shy about that, especially when it comes to another attorney. And it's all about the way you present it. If you come off as condescending or like you're trying to explain something to them because they're they're an idiot, right? They're not going to take that very well. But if you go up to them and say, hey, I was researching this, I, I think that there might be another solution or i think the you know the answers is something different present it and and give your reasoning and give them you know cite to the statute cite to, cite to the case law give them the resources that you use to come up with that answer when it's a judge it's probably a little bit more difficult you want to be respectful you don't want to say hey judge you're wrong but if there's an opportunity to say hey judge may i you know your honor may i be heard may and, i be heard keywords <laughs> yeah your honor may i be heard and, and give your point, right? And and the judge will take it, take it. And if they still don't follow it, you know, maybe the, there's an opportunity for an appeal um, or something of that nature. But at least you've put it on the record. At least you've put it out there that I, I think that this is incorrect or I think that there's another way to look at this. And now a word from our sponsors. 
In these uncertain economic times, the State Bar of Wisconsin wants to make sure that you and your practice have the best available tools. Ultimate Pass and Books Unbound are available for purchase using six-month installment plans. Contact our customer service team at 1-800-728-7788 for more information. Thank you. And now back to the Bottom Up Podcast. That's a great answer. So we had lots of questions, but unfortunately, we can't answer, we can't we can't put all of them in this, in this episode. But I think there's an important one from Abby from Green Bay, and she writes: I encounter clients who specifically request to be matched with attorneys that have more experience than myself. How do you cultivate trust in your capabilities amongst among your clients? Big issue I dealt with. I've had clients who have early in my career, I had clients who would reach out to Emil and say, I want, I want Emil, I want you to handle the case. Not because I was doing anything wrong and not because I wasn't, you know, facilitating the case or, or providing them, you know, with guidance throughout just because they knew I was new or sometimes just because they knew I was woman. And, you know, I had him thankfully to rely on to say, Hey, no, you know, Sam's got it. She's going to handle it. And, you know, I hired her because she's great and she's going to do what it takes to get this done. And they would listen and they'd give me a second chance and what have you. But it's tough. It's it's not easy. It goes back to what we talked about earlier, confidence. You have to instill the confidence in yourself, in your clients, that you know what you're talking about, that you are confident to say you don't know something. If a client asks you a question and you really don't know, do not make it up. Say, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that right now. I'm going to look into it and I'm going to get back to you. They will respect that because if they don't know it and you don't know it, they at least know you know how to find out the mm-hmm. answer. Yeah, and, and this is one of those questions where there, there are two roles here. Um, I think it is incumbent to more experienced attorneys to back younger lawyers 100%. I told my clients since I've so been earlier on, those clients who had those issues, I'm like, hey, if, if you can't work with her, then you can't work with me. And I'm like, you know, I'm backing her. And for the associate, when given that opportunity, you have to kill it. Because clients are easy to convince, right? They just need, the young associates just need an opportunity. And so I would say in instances where that happened in the past, that only happened, you know, the client only had to make that ask once because the moment he got to experience Samantha and her work, you know, they like, you know, the fears were were, were alleviated. And, And I think sometimes Maybe because of how the legal business is structured and a lot, of, a lot of unnecessary internal competition. Maybe because of the way billings and structurings and partnership models and origination, we don't have all that all that nonsense here. I, and and so partners are maybe a little scared or about losing certain relationships. I, I think that that's very myopic. You know, if you're good, you're good. And I believe that everyone should think that they're the best of what they do, or at least aspire to be the best of what they do. That doesn't necessarily make someone else any less. Right to feel that way. So again, I, I think I think that's a great question. I think that's a, that's, a, that's something that um, associates you struggle with. We're going to take one more question from the phone. Caller, welcome to the Bottom Up Podcast. Hi, thank you. My name is Kate, and I'm a first year attorney in Milwaukee. And I was just wondering, is it beneficial or detrimental to compare your career progress with your peers? Do you think this comparison serves as a motivation or a disappointment? Don't compare yourself. It's it's that simple. It's so easy to compare. And I think that's a problem in law school as much as it is um, after you graduate and you become an attorney. You can compare. Uh, I don't even like to say compare. You can ask other, you know, your peers about what they're doing, what they're working on. You can talk to them about things they're learning about, cases they're working on, their relationships in their firm to guide you and say like, okay, is what I'm doing good for me? You know, am I in a healthy environment? Am I learning at a pace I should be learning? Am I uh, experiencing things that I should be experiencing? That's all fine and dandy. But if somebody's got a bigger case than you or they're working less than you or working more than you, you don't know what their, you know, uh, life experiences are. You don't know what the internal, um, their internal affairs are, right? You don't know if they're dealing with stress. You don't know if they're, uh, dealing with other family issues. You don't know if they're hating their job because they have so much pressure on them at work. So comparing from a a high level or from the outside looking in is just going to lead you to to question something that you may not otherwise question. 
had you not talked to them, you might be completely fine, right? You might love what you do. You might be, you know, confident in your abilities. And then you talk to them and now your whole life comes crashing down because you're comparing yourself to them and you start second guessing all the great things that you've done and, and the great place that you're in. So definitely you can have, you should have conversations. You should talk about, you know, your positions, uh, talk about your experiences, but, but don't compare yourself or, or, or feel like you need to minimize the, the work that you're doing or the experiences that you're having because they don't compare or match up to somebody else's. Yeah, and, and I write about this uh, you know, on LinkedIn a lot. It, it, I think the worst thing a younger associate can do or a young lawyer can do is to compare themselves because if you start off your career that way, you'll never get a sense of you, who you are and what you want to be in the law. It, it's you versus you. It's your race. If you're going to do any comparisons, it's, it should be today's you versus the you of yesterday or the best versions of you you aspire to be. And that way you get to really carve out a journey that's truly yours and you get to define success on your terms because if you get into that game of comparison it's endless it's purposeless and it's just going to wear you down beat you up even before you start we're going to take one last one last question it's a written one i think it's a very good one i just get a short answer to this from we have from andrew um who's out of milwaukee county he, he asked when receiving some difficult or frustrating feedback on a project or work product do you have any tips on how to reorient yourself or maybe or, or make sure you're internalizing the feedback that has value but not beating yourself up about it that is a great question and one that i think a lot of people struggle with you should always be getting feedback and you should always be getting some critique that's how you grow and that's how you learn it's easy to see a document with a bunch of red lines and think that you failed. It's easy to submit a brief and then have opposing counsel submit another brief just bashing everything you've said. The key to getting over that or, or reorienting yourself as the question poses it is to understand that it's a learning opportunity and it's a step forward. By getting this feedback, you're now going, you, you know, your next contract that you draft is going to be even better. The next deal you negotiate is going to be even better. The next brief you write is going to be even better. It gives you a sense of, a sense of accomplishment in that you've at least done the work and now you know the, you know, the next best thing to do when it comes up again. So don't get down on yourself. Don't feel like a failure. See it for what it is as a learning opportunity. But you said this earlier, Emil, then do the work and, and, and don't make those mistakes again. Absolutely, um, because you, know, you, you can have you can have the progress, or you can have the emotion, but you can't have both at the same time. Um, and I think you know focusing on just the emotion of "Hey, I'm a disappointment" doesn't lead you to progress. And that's not to say that that, that emotion is invalid, but an emotion being valid itself doesn't lead you to the progress. So it's just if if take it take it in stride as long as it's moving you closer to a better, more empowered versions of yourself as a lawyer. Well, Sam, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. I think this has been one of our best. So many great tips for young lawyers who are probably facing a lot of these issues and having a lot of these feelings. And knowing that you went through a lot of these things and are still going through them and working through those challenges is really going to bring more confidence to younger attorneys to really be able to work through those issues. So I really appreciate you coming on today. Thank you. And um, from the bottom of my heart, Sam, I want to thank you very much. Uh, I know you, I've learned so much from you. You've inspired me in ways that you probably would never know. And I'm so honored to call you not just my law firm partner, but also my friend. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Emil. And thank you, Joe. This has been great. Again, I was nervous to start, but I think this has been a great show. And uh, I hope, I really hope that those who are listening take some some tips from this, you know, young and old attorneys, because I think it's, it's important to remember what it's like to first step into your shoes as a lawyer. Sam Huddleston Baker, everybody. Thanks, Sam. Thanks for listening to our podcast. If you have a topic you'd like us to explore, let us know. I'm your host, Emil Ovia Gailey, and we'll catch you next time.